I'd like to formally now introduce Dr. Garima Sharma. Um, Garima is a specialist in the dentist, and uh, she works with uh, Ed Gentle and Endodontics in Chatswood, Parramatta, as well as in Double Bay. Now, Garima has got extensive experience in both general practice and is a specialist practice. Um, when I asked Garima to give this important lecture, and she said to me, What do you want to lecture on, Sarkis? I said, I want you to talk about diagnosis dilemmas in endodontics because it's something that people need to understand. Because how you think and your diagnostic angle, every specialist is very different. So I'd like you to have your take on how you view things. And it allows you to help the dentists, the referring dentists, and as well as your patients to be able to uh, formulate what's the right consent for them and also formulate what's the right treatment plan for the patient. So it's a whole teamwork. And uh, the college is instrumental in developing that teamwork for the general dentist to help them in their practices, to advance their critical thinking knowledge, to understand the risk benefit ratio of the treatment and naturally go on to save teeth. Implant is not always the answer. And uh, we know that saving teeth is number one. And sometimes you can't save teeth and we accept it. So Garma is also um, academic. She teaches at uh, Sydney University of Sydney, doing undergraduates. She has published many papers. She's also been awarded by the community, the, um, the, uh, the Hindu Council of Australia for contributions in science. And that's a wonderful thing. So today, today, um, Garma will present about uh, focus on establishing Definitely the endodontic diagnosis, which is essential uh, in terms of both papal and apical pathology and signs and symptoms, how they present in a dynamic format. So it's important to understand why you take scumbing CT or PA, which is better, and how do you combine them both for the, that critical diagnostic assessment, and, uh, and how to integrate those concepts in your practice. So, so we know that we want to preserve the teeth, and uh, uh, in, at times, and root canal therapy is most appropriate. Uh, but understand that not everything is perfect and there are limitations depending on what the assessments by the endodontist and what the patient's expectations are. So it'll be an interesting day. I'm really looking forward to this, Garima. I'm very much looking forward to this. And so just before I introduce this, I will talk about a few things later on because I have some of the questions. We're going to talk about very interesting topics. I recently referred Garima a patient. We'll discuss the patient as well at the end of the lecture. So stay tuned. This is going to be one of the best lectures that you've ever had in terms of the endodontic treatment and how the prostodontists and the endodontists put their heads together to get things right. And we're going to share our knowledge with you. So Garima, I'm going to make you a co-host, my dear. I'm going to just do this. I actually. Uh, I'm going to make you a host so you can share your screen and start a lecture. And thank you for accepting uh, to lecture for the college. Thank you. You're the host. So I'm going to stop sharing. Can you see, see my slides? Yeah. Yeah, okay, sure. Okay. But I need the main slides. So open the main slides. Yes. So, I... Yeah, we can see the whole slides. So you just open the, the, the main one. So if you're sharing it, share the big one. Uh, yes. You... Can you see that or not? We can, we can see them all, but we see all the slides at the same time. So. Just, yeah, go to the... Is it, is it still on the small version? Yes, go to, go to this one, that's right. The other one, the right, go to the right, click. That's perfect, thank yes. you. Yep, excellent. I'm just getting a water, please go ahead. Yeah, okay. 
Thank you. Thank you for the kind introduction and thank you for having me here tonight. And thank you for everybody who's joined us. Um, and all right, so today I'll be talking about dilemmas in endodontic diagnosis. Um, quite a good topic because diagnosis is, you know, it is, it, it is the main part before we even start treating our patients. Um, the American Association of Endodontists actually described diagnosis as they defined it. It is the art and the science of detecting and distinguishing deviations from health and the cause and nature thereof. It is like a jigsaw puzzle as you see in the picture. It, you cannot just make diagnosis from a single piece of information. You need to have all the information gathered together. And of course, we cannot overemphasize that. It is critical in all the cases. Of course, if you don't have a diagnosis, you can't have a treatment plan or you can't treat a patient. And if, if the diagnosis is not correct, of course, the treatment that you've made out of that diagnosis will also not be correct. And so you're not uh, actually um, focusing on the patient's chief complaint. There can be differential diagnosis of, you know, dental pain. It can be odontogenic. It can be, you know, reversible pulpitis, irreversible pulpitis, or it can be apical periodontitis. Um, it can be musculoskeletal. It can be, you know, just pain because of temporomandibular joint disorder, or it can be neuropathic like neuralgia or due to a herpes infection, or it can be neurovascular like a migraine cluster headache, tension headache, or it can be because of an inflammatory condition or a systemic disorder, cardiac pain, hopefully not. Hopefully the patients don't present with cardiac pain to a dentist because sometimes a cardiac pain can Patients with cardiac pain can have referred pain to the jaw, or it could just be psychogenic. So, okay. so what are the main differences between odontogenic and non-odontogenic pain? Of course, if you have odontogenic pain, patients usually present with pain which is unilateral. Um, if patients present with pain involving multiple teeth, or if they say the pain starts from the top right-hand side, goes on to the top left-hand side, then down to the bottom teeth, then of course, that's a red flag. Um, usually odontogenic pain is dull ache, or sometimes it can be throbbing, radiating pain, or aching pain. While on the other hand, non-odontogenic pain can be you know, stabbing pain, electric pain, burning pain, there's usually a etiological factor which is related to an odontogenic pain. You'll see caries, you'll see fractures, cracks, um, trauma. It, it will be relieved by LA. Um, usually patients with odontogenic pain uh, complain of pain to temperature changes or thermal stimuli, sensitivity to hot and cold or on biting pressure. While in non-odontogenic pain, it would usually be not of any etiological factors. It just starts, it may not be consistent. Um, pain would be of longer duration. Pain ha that has been there for many, many months, two years, uh, same intensity. Um, so yes, do consider those factors. Okay, so now if you know already that there is odontogenic or non-odontogenic pain, if we come to odontogenic pain, then we need to make sure that we ascertain there is a pulpal diagnosis and a periradicular diagnosis. It's a dynamic change between the pulpal disease and the periradicular disease. And it's very important that we have both the diagnosis, not just one diagnosis, not just a pulpal diagnosis. Because if you look at that chart, which is from um, Australian Dental Journal article from 2007 by Professor Paul Abbott, that chart actually shows there, if there is a clinical normal pulp, there is such a dynamic that it can go from reversible pulpitis to irreversible pulpitis if it's not treated, or it might arrest from, at, from chronic to, or it can become acute. It can go from pulpitis stage to even necrobiosis, or, or it can go to pulpal necrosis as well. or it can go from 
necrotic and infected pulp to uh, pulpless and infected root canal system? Gorima, I can ask a question. Yeah, yeah, sure. Go for it. You know the word necrobiosis? Now, yes. Uh, uh, I remember I was in my fellowship exam and I wrote in a paper, it could be necrobiosis. And uh, I know Paul Abbott wrote the article in ADA, mm -hmm. ADJ. So can you talk a bit more about necrobiosis? I said this in my surgery quite often and I have good dentists who work with me as dentists as assistants, so they get a bit confused. So this is, I think, an ideal opportunity for you to just go the word necrobiosis. I, is, is anyone else in the, in the audience have heard about necrobiosis before? Yes or no? It's a quick answer. No, uh, <clears throat> Dr. Chris, Chris says no, no. Dr. Dr. Sharma, please proceed. Okay, sure. Okay, so necrobiosis is actually a very good term. So necrobiosis is, it happens in teeth which have both the inflamed tissue as well as necrotic tissue at the same time. It, it most of the time it's there in multi-rooted teeth when one of the canal is completely necrotic and the other canal has inflamed tissue or in case of some other teeth which are not multi-rooted, coronally it will be necrotic. Epically, you might still have some inflamed tissue. And these are the teeth which are the hardest to diagnose because they come with varying signs and symptoms. Pulp sensibility test would also be not very conclusive because one time you test, they'll, they'll give no response. And the other time you will have response that you would expect from an inflamed tooth. So. Uh, thank you for asking that question. It's actually a, a very good term and sometimes these teeth are really, really difficult to diagnose. So I hope um, everybody it's understands. It's a dilemma. It comes and goes and refers pain. You don't know where it is. And mm. if it's a second molar, they come with a TMD pain and I say it's not TMD. And mm. to, to isolate palpable pain is probably most difficult. It is. And uh, in, in many times, uh, patients who have history of TMD, they think it's a uh, TMD. So it's vice versa. And I think dentists need to understand this as a part of the diagnostic armamentarium in assessing the patients. Thank you so much. Please proceed. Okay. All right. So we need to understand that pulp goes through a varying amount of stages when it goes from inflamed to necrobiosis to necrosis to completely necrotic, and then it becomes pulpless and infected. So how do we diagnose all these conditions of the pulp and the periradicular tissues? Um, we need to have a systematic approach with our examination. So how do we incorporate that? First of all, before we even jump to, to examination, we need to make sure that we go through the medical and dental history. Um, it is very vital. It's not only telling us taking a medical history to avoid problems during the treatment, but it also helps us in um, you know, formulating treatment plans because first of all, we need to know if we are treating a patient, we need to understand what's their cardiac condition is like. Do they need any antibiotic prophylaxis? Is there any um, heart condition that we should be aware of that, that they are at risk of infective endocarditis? Um, are they on any IV bisphosphonates? And if yes, how long are they taking? Will, they ha will that have any impact on our treatment plan, on our treatment decision? Or are they allergic to any antibiotic? Are they allergic to latex? Before we even examine them, we need to make sure um, they, they don't have any allergies. Um, once we do with our medical and dental history, then it's very important we come to the pain history. This is the most important part of our diagnosis. We need to ask, what's the description of pain? You know, as we saw in the earlier slide, we need to know the characteristics of pain. Is it a dull ache? Is it a throbbing pain? Is it a radiating pain? What's the site of pain? Is it on top right hand side or you know top left hand side? Can can they actually or it sometimes when the patients are in a lot of pain they can't even um, pinpoint whether it's the top teeth or the bottom teeth because sometimes the you know, odontogenic pain can be referred from the top side to the bottom side. Um, time analysis, 
this is really important because if the patient presents with a pain that's been present for more than six months and the intensity hasn't changed, um, that's again a red flag. Or if it's been present for years and years um, and the intensity hasn't changed, then you need to be very mindful of when you take the history and do the examination, whether it's really odontogenic pain. What are the exaggerating factors? Is it exaggerated by hot or cold stimulus? Is it exaggerated on biting pressure? Is it exaggerated on biting hard food? Are there any psychological or lifestyle factors, stress? Is there any um, parafunctional habits? Do they grind? Do they clench? Once you go through the pain history, it's very important that we check tooth or teeth if multiple teeth are involved. For any restoration, if that's present, it's fractured, uh, it's leaking restoration, check for cracks like in the, um, the, the clinical image on the top right hand side. As you can see, there's a crack, mesodistal crack going through the occlusal surface. Transillumination light, which you can see in the picture below. Um, it's a very, very good tool to have in your armamentarium. Cracks or craze lines, you can really see uh, when you transilluminate. And I'll go a bit more into detail a bit later. Frack winder, it's very important if the patient complains of pain on biting pressure. Apart from looking at the tooth, don't, don't forget about the periodontal assessment. Are, are there any deep pockets generalized or localized to a particular tooth? Is there any uh, deep, narrow pocket? Once you do that, then make sure you come to your pulp sensibility test. Why do we do pulp sensibility test. Of course, we want to make sure that we get a response or we don't get a response, but also what's the nature of the response? Um, does the, does, uh, is there a normal response or is there a lingering response or is there no response at all whatsoever to the pulp sensibility test? That is very important to know because that tells us if the pulp is in reversible or irreversible stage. Then going to our percussion palpation, and it's very important that we correlate the sensibility test with our radiographic findings. Um, when you take radiographs, of course, I always, always do take a bite wing radiograph um, because of course it tells us a lot more about um, the restoration. Uh, if there is a crown or an onlay, and of course the fit of that restoration. So this is again a very good article, the same article that summarizes all the um, relevant examinations you would do, the test you would do, uh, the radiographic examinations would you do, and how would you correlate all of them together. And sometimes if we still can't make a diagnosis, then we just sometimes have to investigate, remove all the restoration caries and crack assess the tooth periodontally and odontically and restorative aspect as well. And also check, does the tooth need any further treatment if you are thinking that the tooth does need an odontic treatment, but is there a periodontal aspect to the presenting condition as well? Okay. Sometimes, you know, our radiographs, though they only uh, present, you know, the periapical radiographs, they only, uh, they do have their limitations because they're only giving us a two-dimensional uh, image of something which is three-dimensional. So this is a very good article that was published in Journal of Endodontics in 2014. This article, uh, 30 cases were taken from an endodontic practice, uh, which had periapical radiographs. Um, and three endodontists examined those cases. They were shown the periapical radiographs and two weeks later, they were shown the CBCT scan. And the treatment plan was made after they were shown the periapical radiographs and after they were shown the CBCT scan. And this study concluded that there was change in the treatment plan in 
50 to 60 percent of the cases because of the additional information that was gained from the CBCT scan. So CBCT scan is a good adjunct um, in diagnosis, but of course we don't routinely take those scans for every case, but yes, we'll discuss that a little bit more in detail. Sorry, but just on that last one, my dear, uh, in yes. terms of CBCT, mm -hmm. when, you, when, you, when they modify 62% of the cases, what sort of modica modification were, were, were made, for instance, um, they didn't do root therapy or there were more chances of doing root therapy because they missed up, like say, uh, additional canal or the... Yes, I think in, it, it differed in all the cases, but in most of the cases, some cases they decided not to do because of the additional information they gained from the scan that was conclusive of that, yes, it's not, um, it's not a good treatment to proceed with the endodontic treatment. So, yes. So when you when a patient comes to you, uh, how often would you take a combium CT, for instance? I wouldn't take routinely, but mm -hmm. of course, in some selective cases, when you need that additional information that you don't get it from your either clinical examination or your, um, you know, just your normal uh, radiograph, right. then yes. But I'll show you some cases as well in which CBCT has actually helped or it gives us additional information, which of course you can't see in the radiograph. Thank you, thank you. All right, so going forward, um, American Association of Endodontists and uh, Association of Oral uh, and Maxillofacial Surgeons, they released a joint statement in 2015, 2016, um, regarding the use of cone beam CDs for endodontics. So this statement is a very good statement. I encourage everybody to have a good read of that um, because it provides scientifically based guidance to clinicians regarding the use of CBCT. Of course, it's not to replace the clinical judgment uh, on, you know, so it's not saying that you should, we should do CBCT for every routine case, but it's saying when it would be beneficial or when it gives us more information. So we still need to do our, clinical examination, we still need to do our own radiographs, uh, periapical radiographs, that's the gold standard. This is not to replace that, but of course, in some cases, it's, it's helpful. And for most endodontic assessment, we do a limited field of view. We don't do a, a large or a big field of view. Of course, it's less radiation to the patient. It's higher resolution because in endodontics, we want to see canals, you want to see like the best resolution we can and shorter volumes to be interpreted. Look at the other side, because if you are taking large field of view, you are responsible for interpreting as well. Um, and you don't want to be interpreting the whole head and neck, because if you miss something, there is a medical legal implication. If something was present and you didn't pick it up, so be mindful of the medical legal implications of missing something because at times in the CBCT scans, they can be, um, you know, um, not normal uh, appearance of the tissues or structures as well. So they came up with recommendations for taking a CBCT scan. Um, first one was diagnosis, which comes with contradictory or non-specific clinical signs and symptoms. Preoperative assessment in teeth which have complex or unusual root canal morphology, of course, it's really helpful in that. And some teeth do have a complex or unusual root canal morphology or in teeth with very, very calcified canals. In non-surgical retreatments, um, in order to assess what the previous treatment complications were like, if there are separated instruments, of course, you would want to know in which canal the instrument is, whether the you know, if it's a mesial canal of a lower molar, do the mesial canals join epically or not? Um, for pre-surgical treatment planning, of course, to evaluate proximity to anatomical structures, um, assessment and management of trauma and resorption, it is really helpful, especially to know the extent of the resorption. It is, um, it, it, it gives you great detail, which I'll show you in the case later on as well. Okay, so then um, 
AAE, which is the American Association of Endodontists, in 2018, um, they released this uh, newsletter as well, which, which you know, talks about the impact of the cone beam in endodontics, saying it's a new era in diagnosis and treatment planning. So looking at the cases which comes up with contradictory or non-specific signs and symptoms. So this is a case which I saw in practice. This patient was referred for endodontic management of tooth 1-6. Patient chief complaint was pain on biting pressure, which started after the mesiobuccal cusp fracture of tooth 1-6. So some time ago, about six months ago, uh, the mesiobuccal cusp uh, fractured, which was subsequently restored by his general dentist. Afterwards, he developed sensitivity to cold stimulus. He returned back to the dentist and of course, uh, dentist thought that sometimes it can happen with the restoration. It might take a little bit longer to settle, um, but progressively it became sensitive to hot, then then later on biting pressure. So the patient came in pointing uh, to tooth 1-6, said, doctor, it's my tooth 1-6, or this tooth pointing to 1-6, that that's the cause of pain. You take the history, you, you, know, you look clinically, so yes, you take radiographs. Um, tooth 1-6 doesn't look a very deep restoration at all. Um, when you look clinically, you see a crack on one five, um, there is a mesodistal crack on one five. You do your sensibility test. Of course, one five does not respond at all to, you know, the CO2 pulp sensibility test. There is a deep pocket as well. Uh, that makes you think it's definitely not the one six, which is responding to, though it was slightly tender to percussion, but it was responsive to the um, CO2 pulp sensibility test, uh, parental probing depths all within normal limits. Um, I did take a limited field of UCBCT as well, which showed some widening around 1.6 and very nice curved root of the 1.5, one, one sorry, widening on 1.5, not 1.6. Um, so yes, the diagnosis for that tooth was, it was the 1.5 indeed. So sometimes patients can present with varying or heat he thought because the pain started when the cusp fractured, he linked that pain to as linked to after the cusp was fractured and linked to one five, uh, one six, not one five. So it's very important. We look at the adjacent teeth. We do the sensibility test on the adjacent teeth as well to make sure that we are treating the right tooth, uh, not the wrong tooth. So the yeah, yes. No, go ahead. Please finish. I'm just going to ask you a question. Sorry. You're saying? You're asking me something now? No, I'm going to ask you something now. Just for the audience, would somebody know why there was a discomfort on 1.6, although the pain was on 1.5, but was why 1.6 had discomfort to start with as well, which was, you know, the reason that is referred to patient. Why 1.6? And suddenly there's a 1.5 the issue with. Can anyone work that out or not? in the audience they, so, uh, yes exactly my point the issue was on one five but because he linked it to the pain might have started at the same time the crack might have happened at the same time on one five when one six started okay, now dr how was saying was this post orthodontics post i don't think no, no 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 history of ortho at all yes i mean you can see i mean if you look at the history Patient mm -hmm. fractured the, uh, was it distal lingual cusp? Is that right? Mesiobuccal cusp, yeah. Mesiobuccal cusp, which is common. Okay, mm -hmm. um, so the fractured mesiobuccal cusp. And the tooth is, not, is it restored or unrestored tooth? It the is restored. So six is initially, restored. Initially, was it restored or unrestored? The unrestored. One. Unrestored. So there was unrestored that is fractured. So the chances are the patient, and you can see slight widening of pedal membrane on the upper right slide of the, of the tooth mm -hmm. six. Okay, so the chances of patients heavily clenching on this tooth, hence the reason for that fracture. So the history will tell you which way it's going. And naturally, you can see there's an apical area of the two five, which is which may not be present during PA, but that's where the combium city will help you. Is that correct? Yeah. Yes, okay. that's yes. Someone, I've got a message here. I do apologize. Uh, 
Dr. Sarkis, we've got we've got a comment from Anitya. He says, uh, maybe the result of occlusion, which results in both the fracture of the mesobuccal cusp along with the slight TTP presenting on okay. tooth number one six. When you talk about occlusion, is it occlusion or forces, duration and time? What are you talking? You need to say occlusion means nothing. Okay, it's forces. Mm. So that I assume that you're saying it's forces. I'm sure that's what you're saying. So mm -hmm. in in this correct, thank you. So it's not uh, occlusion, it's forces. Okay. You can have a patient with an alligator bite. If they're not putting the forces, it means nothing. I'm just trying to make an explain. Thank you, Vanita, for your question. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Yes, that's a good question. But I think the uh, patient might have developed, of course, the patient was a uh, heavy clencher grinder, Braxa. How um, saying, he would have. have... Mm -hmm. so go ahead. Sorry, I'm sorry. That? Sorry, Dr. Howard's saying that why is there a dihiscence on 1-6? Uh, uh, Sarkis, so, so we, have, we have another comment from Diana. She says uh, parafunction. Yes, that's right. Yes. So related to that. Yes, yes, yes. 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 So yes, there, there is parafunction habits. Uh, patient does have parafunctional habits. So yes, there was the mesial distal crack, which I believe it might have happened the same time when he fractured the cusp on the mesiobuccal uh, cusp of the 1-6. Both started at the same time. However, he developed deeper crack on 1-5 that led to the necrosis of the pulp in 1-5. And so the presenting symptoms were from 1-5. 1-6 needs to be monitored. Um, and then if you see in the slide on the bottom left hand side, the mesial distal crack. And as soon as you go into the pulp, you see it's completely necrotic. And there was crack extending on the mesial surface all the way into the pulp chamber and, and into the orifice. Um, as you can see in the very, very bottom uh, clinical image. So yes, this tooth, because the crack is communicating with the root canal system, unfortunately, does not have a good long-term prognosis. So. Um, Apart from treating these conditions, it's very important to uh, also treat the underlying parafunction habit as well. Otherwise, these things will repeat on another tooth and you know, we don't want the similar outcome for the other teeth. Okay, so preoperative anatomy assessment. Um, cone beam CT can be really helpful in, uh, you know, getting the preoperative assessment, especially in this case. So this patient was referred because he, he was having a pain with hot stimulus. Um, he, he knew that he's definitely coming from 2-7. Of course, this was endodontically treated um, two years ago by his general dentist. Um, but he one day, all of a sudden, he developed severe pain. Um, so the, it was tended to percussion. Um, when you take a cone beam CT of this, and in these cases, it does really help because you need you want to make sure if there is a missed canal or you know, or if there's something else, or is there unusual anatomy? This tooth had quite a quite a nice uh, unusual anatomy. So if you look in the um, CBCD scan here, there was an additional canal that actually is a C-shaped palatal canal communicating with the mesial canal. So very nice anatomy. So of course, that additional uninstrumented canal was giving all the um, presenting symptoms. Uh, so that was, this tooth was retreated. Um, and the symptoms settled. So that's the pre-op and the post-op radiograph. As you can see, uh, the additional canal when it was instrumented and medicated, the following visit, the symptoms subsided and then it was obturated. So in these kind of cases, of course, cone beam CT, limited field of view, helps a lot in making a correct diagnosis and then plan for such cases. All right, so coming to, uh, they can also be very helpful when we need to uh, manage or assess trauma or resorption, especially to know the extent of the resorption, which um, you can't see in a radiograph in most of the cases. In some cases you can. 
Um, looking at this case, this was referred for endo assessment and management of resorption on 2.7. Clinically, you can see, uh, you know, the evidence of resorption on the palatal surface. You see the gingiva in growth into the root surface. Um, you can see the radiolucency into the furcation and around the palatal root, but not quite obvious that you could see the extent. So a cone beam CT was taken. Um, you do see the moth-eaten radiolucency, which is there on the mesial, as well as the distal aspect of the palatal root. And if you look in the axial view and in the other views, you can see it extends to the middle third of the root. Um, it is, this is a case of external invasive cervical resorption. Uh, because of the extent of the resorption, this case was deemed poor long-term prognosis. Look in this slide here. Um, and it was, you know, it, it needs to be extracted. So cone beam CT in such cases is really helpful in planning for such cases. How about for vertical root fracture? There is a very good article by Faya the Chol, which was published in um, 2012, uh, published in Journal of Endodontics, which, which talks about the findings that are there on CBCT scan that can be consistent with vertical root fracture. However, I say consistent or suggestive of, however, you need to just not take these findings into consideration, but also look clinically. Um, if there is a loss of buccal bone in the mid-root area, but coronally and apical to that defect is intact, that is consistent or suggestive of a vertical root fracture. If there is an absence of the entire buccal plate of bone in axial, coronal, or the 3D view, if you see a radiolucency where a post terminates, of course, that can be suggestive, but of course, you need to look at other things too. If there's space between the buccal or the lingual plate of bone and the root surface, and of course, if you can visualize a vertical root fracture on the CBCT views, which does not happen routinely though. So in the same paper, they um, showed some cases as well. So in this CBCT scan, you can see there's a bone loss in the mid-root area. However, the buccal plate is intact epically and coronal to that defect. But they did raise a flap to confirm that there was a vertical root fracture. And yes, they, they confirmed it. Um, if there is complete buccal bone loss in the CBCT, that also can be consistent with vertical root fracture. Um, in this case as well, they, they extracted the tooth and they confirmed it. However, all these things we need to take with a grain of salt. This is a very good study uh, by Oliver Pope, Shankar Satan, and Peter Parashal that came from Melbourne. In this study, they compared the appearance of the healthy periapical tissues on cone beam and compared with radiographs. So, uh, about 200 teeth they looked at, um, teeth that had CO2 pulp sensibility test, electric pulp test, um, and had a periapical radiograph. And also they had CBCT scan. So in some of the healthy periapical tissues, even in the CBCT scan, they came up as radiolucency or two to four millimeters of PDL widening. Um, so that means sometimes a CBCT scan can overdiagnose um, even a healthy periapical tissue. So always it's very important we do take our periapical radiographs and do our uh, sensibility testing and correlate all the findings together because sometimes the CBCT can over exaggerate the situation. So we don't just want to be seeing a PDL widening in a CBCT scan and think that tooth needs an endodontic treatment. So yes, that needs to be um, taken into consideration. All right, so let's look at some clinical cases with dilemmas in endodontic diagnosis. So this 30-year-old patient was uh, 
referred to me for pain diagnosis in quadrant two. Um, as you can see, he has he all his teeth are unrestored. There's not even a single restoration. He complained of severe pain with thermal stimulus. Um, he couldn't pinpoint which tooth was causing the pain. So you look, you know, you go through your clinical examination, you check extraorally, you check intraorally. Um, so there were some craze line and cracks noted on two, two five. Um, two five was tended to percussion. Um, did not respond to pulp sensibility test at all. Two four, two six, two seven, all of them responded to pulp sensibility test. As you can see in the clinical picture, of course the diagnosis. Um, Sorry, 2.5 gave exaggerated response to the um, pulp sensibility test. All the others gave normal response. So, of course, the diagnosis was irreversible pulpitis on 2.5. Access was gained into the pulp chamber. There was a crack on the uh, occlusal surface that just got right onto the roof of the pulp chamber, did not communicate at all with the root canal system. So that tooth was endodontically treated and uh, after you know it was instrumented and medicated, uh, the symptoms settled um, and the endodontic treatment was completed. All right, so I have a question for you, Dr. Sakis. Um, how would you restore this tooth? Would you just do a you know, access restoration on this tooth or would you do a cusp covered restoration because both the mesial and the distal marginal ridges are intact. Patient is a bruxa. Right, right. Well, uh, naturally there's a reason why there's a, uh, you know, powerful um, loss of powerful vitality because of the extreme forces and duration on this tooth. Um, now I would, the, I mean, naturally it's a very well executed endodontic treatment because you've maintained the marginal ridges, ridges both mesially and distally. And uh, there's a really good article that Rhea et al. talked about back in 1989. And they talked about if the marginal ridge is intact, they did on molars, but this is more also plus the premolars. There's no reason to cram because you've got edible bulk tissue to support the tooth the core and the whole um, coronal reticular system. So therefore, uh, I would place a simple composite restoration here, bond it and reduce the lateral excursive movements on this tooth. And naturally every six months maintain that the forces are minimal on this tooth, both in centric and excursive movements. Would yeah. you agree? Yeah, I 100% agree. Thank you for that. Thank you. All right, moving on to the second case. Um, this patient was also referred for pain diagnosis around T25 and T26. Um, the dentist wasn't sure uh, the cause of the problem was T25 or T27. Um, if patient complained of pain on biting pressure, there was no uh, pain with thermal stimulus. But if you look at the radiograph, of course, the restoration on the 2.5 seems pretty close to the pulp chamber. 2.4 is unrestored. Um, 2.7, of course, medially tilted, has uh, occlusional amalgam restoration. Again, you do your pulp sensibility test, test, check your probing depths. There was a deep pocket that was noted on the distopalatal aspect of 2.7. And if you look at the cone beam scan here, you do see some alveolar bone loss in the cervical third on the distopalatal aspect. So clinically, this is how the tooth looked. You can see cracks on the medial surface as well as the distal surface on the 2.7. Uh, as I mentioned, there was a deep pocket um, distopalatally on 2.7. So 2.7 was the cause of the presenting symptoms. Um, diagnosis for 2.7, infected root canal system with symptomatic apical periodontitis. Um, there was a crack uh, that 
that was noted on the distal surface that extended all the way into the palatal canal orifice that was noted upon access into the pulp chamber. So of course, when the crack extend into the root canal system, I don't know if you can see very clearly or not, uh, the extent of that crack on the right hand side picture, but it does extend into the canal orifice. Brilliant images, by the way, brilliant. Okay. Um, um, so yes, that tooth has a poor long-term prognosis and extraction was um, recommended. Okay, looking at another case, uh, this was again referred um, for pain diagnosis around 2425. Patient said he had pain initially with cold and hot food and now more recently on biting pressure. All these premolars are getting those cracks. Um, so of course, in the clinical uh, image, you can see a mesodistal crack onto that premolar. It was a case of a split tooth and I've actually got a video that let's see if I can say. So unfortunately, that premolar has, it's a split tooth, mesodistal crack. As soon as we access the pulp chamber, we could see it's extending all the way subgingivally. Unfortunately, this patient also is clenching grinding. In this pandemic, we have seen um, almost every day, lots and lots of cases of cracks, people getting too stressed. Um, and yes, it has a great impact on their teeth and dentition. Um, so yes, that's the other downside of this pandemic, um, people clenching teeth more. So we need to be mindful of that as well when we assess our patients these days. Um, all right, so when we, I've talked a lot about cracks, so let's go a little bit more into detail about cracks. Um, again, AAE uh, published this on cracks. So they have classified longitudinal cracks as craze lines, which craze lines are the one that extend only in enamel. They can be present on the buccal or the lingual surface. Um, fractured cusp, um, which, are, which can be incomplete or complete fracture initiated from the crown and extends subgingivally. It can be mesodistally or buccolingually. Next is cracked tooth, which is an incomplete fracture, which is again initiated from the crown. Um, it is usually directed mesodistally. Split tooth, as I showed in the previous case, it is a complete fracture initiated from the crown, extending subgingivally, usually directed mesodistally through both of the marginal ridges. And vertical root fracture, it can be complete or incomplete fracture, which is initiated um, from the root at any level and usually directed buccolingually. So do all teeth with cracks need to be extracted? Um, well, it depends upon the location of the crack and the extent of the crack. But if the cracks extend into the canal orifices or they communicate with the root canal system, of course, they have a poor long-term prognosis. This is a very good study uh, that was published in Journal of Endodontics in 2016. So a recent one, it looked at the distribution characteristics and the survival uh, of cracked teeth after the root canal treatment since I've shown so many cases of the premolars. So why are maxillary premolars more affected with cracks if we compare them to their mandibular counterparts or their mandibular premolars? It's because they have a deep cusp fossa relationship. If you look at the anatomy of a maxillary premolar, they have steep inclines. And if there is um, parafunction habit, they get more prone to, uh, or they get more susceptible to cracks as compared to mandibular premolars. And also this study looked if there is a crack that, that's a superficial crack, but it has a probing depth of more than six millimeters, it is associated with reduced survival. So when we talk about survival is how long will the tooth survive after root canal treatment? If we talk about maxillary and mandibular pre, uh, molars, if the oblique ridge in maxillary molars gives a resistance form, 
to the crack formation. So mandibular second premolars are most frequently affected by cracks also because they have a proximity to TMJ. Uh, more mesticatory forces on the mandibular second molars and also they have the deeper central fossa that makes them more prone to cracks. Okay, let's look at this interesting case. Um, this patient was referred for an odontic assessment of previously endodontically treated teeth. Four different teeth uh, in the same patient treated all at different times by his previous dentist and all are failing. Why? So, of course, there's a very obvious mesial root fracture um, of the 1-6. One, 1-7 had a similar pattern, um, alveolar bone loss, deep narrow pocket on the mesial root. So unfortunately both the uh, one six and four six need to be extracted, but looking at one four and one five, even though radiographically they, the endodontic treatment looked to desired length and the crown seemed to be looking okay. But if you look clinically in that picture, there was, you know, catch at the crown margins. Um, so it was discussed with the patient that uh, will remove the crown restoration and assess the underlying tooth structure and the core mm -hmm. um, to see what's the, you know, to further assess the tooth. So on removal of the crown on, um, on one of the premolars, you could see there is recurrent caries. Uh, there is marginal penetration and leakage in the underlying core. By the time you remove the, um, all the restoration and caries, it ended up having, you know, no ferrule at all. So that would explain if there is leaching underneath the crowns, of course the endodontic treatment would fail. So we need a good, well sealed restorations um, after any endodontic treatment is done. Um, do you have any questions on that, Dr. Sarkis? Sorry, uh, if you go back two slides, just go back two yes. slides. Another one. You can see on the slide, I mean, upper right, where there's a totally poor marginal seals on those. And uh, it's astounding that the patient ends up paying so much money for endodontics and having a poor marginal seal by the final cramps. Now, this is something very, very important. Could you go to the next slide, please? You can see on the slide on the upper right segment where there's recurrent carries, you know, there's recession, poor margins. That's why this digital margin of one six gone absolutely no for no reason. And it's usually related to, you know, poor preparation, poor impression, poor techniques. And uh, from your point of view, when you do the restoration, how important it is to get that marginal seal. Now you've done your job. Now you want the dentist to make sure they can restore this. Okay, because when root therapy can fail because of poor marginal seal, would that be correct? Yes, absolutely. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we need to make sure that we don't get any contamination into the root canal system or into the margins. Of course, that's that's vital, that's crucial for the long-term um, success of the endodontic treatment and also for that tooth. Um, so of course, th these cases, they show how important and crucial it is for the final restoration after the endodontic treatment as well. If you remember the famous article by Ray and Trope regarding the seal of the crown is more important than the endodontic status, they refuted that they wrong, but that was a quite a famous article, if you remember it. But the steel is yes. very, yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yes. All right, so of course, whenever you're doing a root canal treatment, it's a very good article and I quite like it. This is by um, Professor Paul Abbott that whenever we're doing any treatment, especially endodontic treatment, it's important to remove all of the restoration uh, caries and crack. And you'll be surprised when you remove uh, because if you don't remove the restoration, there's only 56% chance of finding caries and crack. Once you remove the restoration, you'll be amazed how much um, radiographically it might look okay, but 
you would see otherwise. So um, yes, I highly suggest everybody, if they are doing any endodontic treatment, make sure they remove all of the restoration to make sure there is no caries or cracks underneath that core. All right, so we have, um, we, we have done our endodontic diagnosis. We have our pulpal diagnosis. We have a periradicular diagnosis. So it's like endodontic decision-making. How do we decide if that tooth is going to have a long-term prognosis or what factors that help us in uh, deciding that? Make sure you do assess the restorability. Of course, we've discussed that. It's important you remove all of the restoration and see if that tooth can be restored again. If there's no ferrule, if there are cracks communicating with the root canal system, of course, it's, it does not have a good long-term prognosis. Do check the periodontal support. Are there any deep, narrow, isolated pockets or do you see any bony defects in the CBCT scan? Proceed with caution. Uh, also, make an assessment. Sorry, I got a question here, which is relevant to the just yes. what you talked about. It's some Anita. Um, Anita, yeah. yeah. Would you ever chase a crack in a crack cusp whereby the crack may be, crack may be extending uh, subgingivally, but not involving the purple floor? If not, what would, you, what would your management be for such tooth? Thank you, Anita, for your question. That's a good question, Anita. There are two schools of thought. For this, um, some people suggest chasing the crack. Um, of course, if you chase a crack that's subgingivally, by the time you end up chasing the crack, the tooth would be unrestorable. Um, how would you restore that tooth if you start chasing up and going to the crestal level? The other school of thought is you don't chase cracks. If it's not extending into uh, the root canal system or the pulp, you restore them uh, as much as possible you can. Um, but of course, the patient needs to be aware of the long-term prognosis or implications of such teeth are. Um, so these cases are the most difficult ones to uh, manage because of course we don't know how the crack would be, you know, in in few years time or uh, whether it would be pulply involved or if it would have an endodontic implication later on in future. So yes, there's always two schools of thoughts for this. Um, but yes, I personally don't like chasing cracks because by the time you, as I said, if it's subgingival, how are you going to restore by the time you end up removing all of that crack? What are your thoughts on that, Dr. Sarkis? Good question. I would, again, ask the tell the patient, look, Long-term prognosis of this tooth is guarded to poor. However, would you like to retain this tooth? If the answer is yes, I will consider special crown preparation, which, which will be definitely metal ceramic. It cannot be zirconia crown because you're cutting the crap out of this teeth and weakening the whole tooth structure. It's a complex. And it will be very long um, margins, like long sleeve margins, I mean, it goes up gingerly, and you need to have a special preparation here to be able to take the impression at that subgingival level. There's a, there's a special way of doing it, which are called bonnet pickup impressions. And so that will, then you, on a bonnet, on a model, which is a, it's a pattern resin model, which is quite deep, you have to mark where your margins are. You're actually marking where it is but the goal finishes. And that's when you're able to place and cement it with zinc phosphate cement, not with crappy composite cement. Okay, because that's what's gonna give you the best seal and metal will give you the actual, you'll have a slight give, but it has to be very tight feet to go and sit. And that's really, really important. Dr. So, Sarkis, uh, we've got another question from Nimesh. He says, uh, how do you manage those visible cracks on the proximal surfaces and management approach as x-rays don't pick up filling slash crown slash band, asymptomatic non-sensitivity, vital teeth. Uh, just one second. I had a phone call I couldn't get. Let me just look at that. Uh, how would you manage these visible cracks on proximal surfaces and management approach as x-rays didn't pick up? Why well, is the patient symptomatic? I suppose no sensitivity, vital teeth. If patients are asymptomatic, I would do some fine occlusional adjustments, just let it be. 
uh, I wouldn't worry about doing it. Would you agree, Karim, on this? Yes, and also if there are cracks or if there are craze lines, sometimes they can just be craze lines, which are there just in the enamel. They're not usually cracks, cracks. So first we need to ascertain whether they are craze lines or cracks. Um, of course, you need to inform the patient what you can see. Is there any annoying para function that we also need to assess? Um, and then, as you said, of course, you can monitor these, but of course, if you're monitoring over six months, 12 months, if they are increasing or staying the same, then you can proceed further with either, you know, doing cuspal coverage restoration later on, if you think they have increased over a period of time that you've been managing, um, you know, you've been monitoring those teeth. So yeah, I'll go through that. I would also add, if I may, uh, when you have patients with lots of crazed lines and also their parafunctional habits, it's not a bad idea every six months that we do very fine, even with a with a, a jiffy type of polishing point, just to polish those heavy bruxing air, especially during the lateral occlusive movements. And as a prophylactic measure, if they have lost their canine guidance, you can just build the canine guidance and I'll lift off and you know, and it's a marvelous treatment you can provide to your patients. So rather than trying to consider doing some sort of a full coverage or, uh, you know, restoration on those teeth, is asymptomatic, you can change your loading on teeth. And that's what we teach at the college, is to think outside the box, not look at a tooth per se. This is what Garib uh, is explaining, that look at the whole picture, not just the tooth at a time. Thanks, yeah. Good question, Nimesh. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so um, as I was discussing, when you assess a tooth for endodontic treatment, you need to also make sure that um, how the access to the root canal system is because this is very, very important. What's the tooth position like? Um, what's the root canal morphology? It's called a double um, S-shaped bend in it. Are there any previous procedural errors? Is there a fractured instrument in the apical third? And then there is periapical radial sense. You need to make sure that you discuss with the patient what the long-term prognosis for such teeth are before you embark on an endodontic treatment. Is there a focation perforation? How long it's been present? Is there any periodontal pocket associated with it? Is there any alveolar bone loss? Um, also, we need to consider patient factors. Um, reduced mouth opening on an upper seven, patient unable to lie supine. I once had a patient um, during my postgrad training who, who couldn't lie down in the chair. Um, he had some uh, postural um, problems. So he was on a wheelchair. Um, so yes, so these kind of uh, things you need to consider. Patient has a severe gag reflex, wouldn't even able to tolerate um, rubber dam in the mouth or couldn't even take radiographs in such patient. Of course, you can consider um, IV sedation and such patients, they cope pretty well with IV sedation. We do offer IV sedation at our practice, but also do consider unrealistic expectations. Um, if there is a crack in the tooth, What's the long-term prognosis for that tooth? And you need to make sure you discuss it with your patient um, so that they, you know, if, if they have unrealistic expectations about the long-term prognosis, they want to retain it, but they want to make sure that it stays there for, you know, for however long, um, then you need to make sure you discuss all of those things before you start. Um, also, what's the motivation of the patient? Some patients, of course, after the first um, endodontic treatment, they're out of pain and sometimes they don't return. Uh, you need to look at compliance as well. If there are multiple previous failed treatments, you need to, you need to see why, why and how it happened. Um, So, okay, um, just coming to my last slide. So always take a systematic approach towards examination and diagnosis. If there is no diagnosis, no definitive diagnosis that you could make, please do not initiate any treatment. Sometimes pain diagnosis can be difficult, um, but you need to have a diagnosis. CBCT is only an adjunct tool. We don't really rely on it 
um, all the time. Um, you need to further assess the tooth by removing all the restoration caries and cracks, check for cracks, assess if the tooth can be restored again, assess what the long-term prognosis for the tooth is considering the restorative, periodontal and endodontic aspects. I'm not sure what's happening on these slides, <laughs> who's doing that? Yes, thank you. Um, if you have any questions, that's my email and um, happy to answer any questions. Karma, thank you so much for the lovely slides. I'm not sure uh, what this happening. It happens to me too when I'm lecturing, so I have no idea now. Yeah, yeah. Can the general uh, Dr. Yeah, for CBCT. And we have another question from Anitya that was before. He mm -hmm. says, either by stabilizing the tooth adhesively or through an indirect restoration, are we providing a protective effect towards the progression of the crack by bracing of the tooth? I think this is regarding an earlier uh, slide. This one, I'm just reading it now. Which, well, which, which tooth? Was that the premolar we're talking about initially? With a single excess cavity? I, I think so. Uh, and Anita, could you if could you just specify if you're still there? Okay, Anita, is that a premolar tube or what, uh, what are you specifically asking, my dear? It was both to the premolar and also how we were talking about chasing cracks up gingerly, for example, and how we made the decision that sometimes it's best to leave it be. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, fine. I mean, as long as there's no symptoms and there's cracks there, I wouldn't chase the cracks. I mean, basically, there's patients of Braxa. Uh, remember, if you have an amalgam restoration on patients of Braxa, lots of cracks, if you're going to replace the amalgam restoration, you probably make it worse because as you remove the, the amalgam, if there's no issues with the tooth. The whole cusp of flexure occurs with release of stresses. And the tooth is the subject to actual more symptoms than ever. So be careful when you do those things because, uh, uh, you know, you need to make sure that uh, when you remove amalgams, tell the patients that the symptoms might get worse if there's no symptoms. So be careful. Sometimes they're very symptomatic, you remove the restorations, and they suddenly become symptomatic because the, the cuspal flexure that happens in that process. Uh, uh, Gary, Gary, would you agree on that? Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, yes, 100%. And I think as we discussed previously, um, we need to make sure that we look at the underlying, um, you know, cause as well. And mm -hmm. you need to inform the patient. I think that's the most important thing. Um, that we do. Yes. Uh, there was a question about can gel dance refer for Cambium City? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, the only thing I ask is, when you refer a convium CT and you want to do implants, please do not allow a non-dentist plan your implant placement. I'm begging you, don't ever do that, okay? I'm seeing it happen too many times and patients end up here. Uh, okay, now, Garma, thank you. I'm just going to, uh, am I allowed to share Stop. screen? No. Could you allow yeah. me to share screen, Garma? Thank you, my dear. Oh, great. One second, I need to share something. I apologize. Yeah, okay. I'm trying to one second right here. Okay. Uh, I'm trying to share my screen, so one second. Uh, Dr. Garima? Yes? Could you could you make Dr. Sarkis host again? Because he wants to share his screen. Uh, so next to his name, there are three dots that you can click yes. on. And there should be an option, make a host. Easy. Done. Done? Yeah. Okay. I'm just trying to find the, my my end of the... Okay, here. Excuse me. Excuse me. Let's try this. Sorry, no, one second, please. I'm having a problem sharing it. Would you believe that? I can see everyone, but I'm having a problem sharing it. Uh, can you see my screen now? You can't. No. Mm -hmm. Perfect. One sec. Sorry, just a second.
Um, okay, coming there, I do apologize. Lost to share my screen, so I'm here now. Okay, look, I'm uh, just going to, Reverend, please stay with me one below. There's, there's a courses of the college because some other online courses are coming up and the dates will become, the new one will be in January, end of January, early February. These dates are wrong on piece of surgery. So those who are interested in learning how to use this concept, it's not on generally in February, mid-February. So please register your interest with uh, Shrada or send an email to the college. We get that organized. But also a lot of the things about using fiber bonded composites in, in solving, you know, your everyday dental problems and diagnosis and triple planning. It's coming up. So please register your interest. Tufwe uh, and uh, naturally all the other courses are available. Now, Garima, what we discussed today is um, the patient I referred to you um, and uh, you're seeing this patient very soon. I'm writing a referral to you. And the patient uh, basically wants to do complete overall and improving her smile, improving all the works. The restorations were placed, I think some five, six years ago. They're all uh, zirconia. Uh, these are I think, zirconia crowns. And this, this is a veneer, zirconia veneer, zirconia veneer. They're about to pop off. You can see there's a considerable preparation of his teeth with the licking margins. Um, and um, it's, it's a complex case. And uh, so doing my routine examination, as we explained, patient needs considerable dental work to be done. And there's some implants to go on the lower left quadrant. So the question was that, uh, and I did my due diligence as always. Patient comes in for diagnosis and she feels it's very simple. There's no, all the teeth are asymptomatic. There's no pain, no discomfort. So patient has been to a lot of dentists who have taken an RPG, which I haven't got an RPG here at the moment. Uh, and they've made the decision that they can easily replace those crowns, put some implants and everything's perfect. Until I had a look at the patient. As you can see, this is the occlusion view. They start to take a Columbium CT. And you can see some of the areas that are concerned for this patient. And I've got the, uh, you know, this is the, the area of the 4.7. This is 4.6. This is 4.5. Uh, I'm not worried about this radio lucency because that's just an artifact. And looking over here, that's uh, 3.4. There's hardly any buckle bone. Uh, and um, perhaps I'd like to comment on this. This is the lower jaw. There's more on the upper, if you like, if you don't mind. So you haven't seen this patient. You'll see this patient next few weeks. Um, please proceed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> um, Dr. Sarkis, I've okay. got another question. How often do you use stainless stand, uh, sorry, stainless steel bands to stabilize cracked tooth? Thanks. I think that's for Dr. Garima, I think. Well, I can answer with Dr. Garima if it's symptomatic. Oh, sorry. If it's, is it symptomatic? That's the question. Is it symptomatic? Is it symptomatic? Um, so I think Dr. Garima, you, you answer the question because the patient referred to you, okay? You answer the question, please. Okay. All right. So yes, um, as Dr. Sarkis asked, is the patient symptomatic? Why did you place a band? I assume it's symptomatic. I think that's why you stabilized with a band. Um, so again, the same thing, what we discussed in the lecture, um, we need to ascertain what the pulpal status of that tooth is. And when you say it's a cracked tooth, um, what's the extent of the crack? That's the other thing. Uh, could you visualize the crack um, and, you know, um, you know, those kind of things. So there, there is, we need a bit more information, uh, I think, going forward with this question. So when you say it's a cracked tooth, um, where is the crack and what's the extent of the crack? What's the uh, pulpus status initially before? You put the band on and how is the tooth now? What are the patient symptoms? Um, 
you've taken a radiograph. Is there anything on the radiograph that you could see? Uh, so you need to make sure you take all of that information going forward with this case. But yes, we whenever we do endodontic treatment, um, we always, always use a band just to stabilize the tooth, not just for the teeth that have which have cracks, but also to make sure that it has, uh, you know, it, it is stabilized, the tooth is stabilized during the treatment in between the appointments because sometimes we do see patients, there can be some, you know, wait time between the appointments. So we, we want to make sure that the restoration is intact in between those appointments. Um, and yes, we don't want any leakage into the root canal system. So, yes. I can add to that, Garima, as well. One the, no, go ahead, please. Uh, one of the important aspect is that, uh, let's say you have a, you diagnose this cracked tooth and a patient comes to you and their biting is hurting, you did frac finder and you feel this pain. Okay, what I would normally do is that if it's not quite obvious, you know, in transimulation, I would simply do some minute adjustment of the of the cusps, okay, and give the patient time to see if they get better. And there's a you know, good 50% chance they'll get better. But if they come back saying, look, it's quite worse pain, then I think, you know, we need to look at the next stage where you want to do a stainless steel crown, a stainless steel band, or in some instances where I suspect there's a problem, I will probably go ahead and not to worry about the band, I will go ahead and do a, you know, preparation and do the crown straight away, giving the patient opportunity that you may need more therapy in the future. So, uh, but that's a very hard call. So if you're going to do stainless steel crown, that's fine. That's also a given. So it depends on your diagnosis and also experience and the health stage of the patient, history of fractured teeth, where the position of the tooth is, and all the inter-arch and intra-arch, all the relations that you do. So that's very, very important that you need to assess and not just looking at tooth per tooth basis. That's what my take would be. Okay. So Garima, looking at this patient. Now, this is important communication, right? Because I cannot start any treatment on those crowns replacement until I have you assess the root canal therapy form. Okay. Uh, and I will not redo any of these root therapies because I have no idea of the history of the tooth. In your lecture, you mentioned repeated failed root canal therapies. So I cannot tell there's a fractured instrument there all because there's only one slide there. We don't know. You might go in there, you find all sorts of things. Would that be correct? Yes, that's right. Yes. Okay. Yes. Also so, I, mm, so I guess the main uh, the patient wants to replace all the crowns. Is that correct? Is that yeah. what the you see, what's wants? really happening in, in dentistry in, is that a lot of people had a lot of dentistry done about ten years ago. Mm. Okay. And yes, sir. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, 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 go ahead. You were saying something. And and uh, and uh, you know a lot of uh, former reconstructions have occurred, and they start to file. And when things file, you know they're in their age of 60, 65, and they want to have predictability in their life. They want the quality of their life, and uh, mm -hmm. and in and some of them are or may be not in a financial situation. I mean, these people are uh, to to have the dentistry done. So uh, you know, she was quite shocked when I said I need to have all these root therapists treated before I can reconstruct your mouth. Naturally, we will go ahead and place some implants here. Meantime. That's, going to, that's not going to change your treatment plan because it's quite away from there. But nevertheless, uh, uh, to convince the patient that we have chronic infection in the root canal therapy teeth was quite a task because she has no pain. How do you communicate with patients in this situation? Yeah. 
Uh, that's a very good question. I think these are the patients that are the hardest to communicate because when you tell them, and as you said, uh, the patient was in a shock when you told her or him um, that they need to have endodontic treatment reassess or redone, um, especially because they are asymptomatic. They don't understand why they need to have all these things done, but you need to explain to them that why at first place these endodontic treatment are failing. Um, looking from that CVCT slice, uh, I feel the margins are not great of all those restorations, um, isn't it? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, while you're there, a question has come up. It's a very good question uh, mm -hmm. from uh, Roy Ashams. It says, would you use the cornea crown to restore root, canal, root for your teeth? To me, the answer is no. Okay, no. Uh, nobody pays you to say this, by the way. Uh, I don't belong to any of the group trying to um, convince dentists to place zirconia crowns everywhere. I think they're very damaging. Uh, I don't use zirconia crowns. I really do. I do over a thousand crowns a year and maybe one. Uh, most of the time, I'd rather use uh, lithium disilicate, which is Emax crowns, if there's adequate enamel. All time, rather than use zirconia. I'm, I'm not a fan of it. I use zirconia in implant restorative. That's fine but not on tooth restorative, especially root canal teeth. Why? Why? The reason is when you do zirconia preparation of root canal teeth, you're cutting a lot of tooth structure. By cutting through the tooth structure, reducing the core of the tooth, that's already fatigue. Root canal teeth are more drier, okay? They're more brittle. So you need to maintain as much core as you can to be able to improve when you do the crown, the stiffness of the tooth. If you ever had a chance to remove the cornea crown, you can see it like a little dark marker of leakage around the core. But you never see that in the old metal ceramic crowns that use some of the zinc phosphate because the white zinc phosphate film, it still remains after all these many years. So why is that? You gotta think about this. Don't trust anyone when they talk about zirconia crowns are better. I'm, I'm yet to convince on this, okay? I rather use Emax or metal ceramic, especially when you're replacing all crowns. Again, why? Because most of the time your margins are subgingival and you're not gonna get a seal subgingival because there's no enamel. And death in bonding, well, we need to talk about that. Very much, please go ahead. <laughs> All right, no, great explanation on that. And I think we, in practice, I've seen, um, you know, whenever they had zirconia crown for some reason, they ended up um, having failures later on as well. They don't wear, they don't wear, they don't wear. You need a give in the system. You need to have a give in the system, okay? Mm. And, and, and the, uh, as I said, even when I do the my restorations, I will bring them back every six months and you need to check out test the occlusion, make sure there's no fremitus, make sure it's all fine, adjust very fine. I mean, you know, for my reconstruction, you need a tune up. And I explain to the patient, you you know, have a Rolls Royce in your mouth. You need to have a tune up and to refine things because pinpoint interference is the John, 1984. He made causes that root fracture. And people say, I did something just root break, root broke. And quite common more often in zirconia, more often. So I don't know what you're going to find here. And I've explained to the patient that, uh, you know, um, you know she'll go for the crowns, but if you feel any time there's a decay there, uh, then do what you can and I will talk to the patient afterwards. Is that okay? Just say that Stark was explaining what's happening. You know, we've so established this good communication. So it took me an hour to get a you know, organized to see you. So she's all eager to proceed. So this is a complex case. And again, I think, uh, and I'm just hoping that uh, there'll be adequate core there so we can restore. Okay. Um, any comments you want to say on this one before we go to the next one? No, I think uh, if there is adequate um, to structure and you are happy with the restorative aspect of the tooth, then of course, I agree that these teeth need to be retreated because 
I know the patient is asymptomatic, but as soon as you replace these crowns and not have the endo redone, there's more than likely the possibility of flare up later or the patient having pain later. Because mm -hmm. of course, whenever they change in the environment, uh, there is possibility of having that and having those brand new beautiful crowns, you know, you don't want to be drilling through those crowns and then doing the endo revision later. So it's best the endo revision be done before and also making sure, uh, you know, all the all those endo aspects are treated well and truly before um, and possibility of checking for cracks, um, especially in that premolar. Is that a post in that tooth? Uh, in the oh, no. it seems to be a posty, yes. Okay. Yes, but yes. Epically, you may you make that decision if you want to do anything. If it's if you think it's okay, you know, and if you're going to remove the post, it cause more drama. You make that decision. Yes. If it is, yes. so I'm happy to do that. Now, what my other concern is here, and I was hoping that is can any of the participants? Uh, thank you, Dr. Daniel. Uh, can any of the participants? Tell me, is there any other concern that I see around here? Look over here and look over here and then look over here and look over here. What is my other concern that I'm thinking for this case on the long term? Uh, Dr. Sarkis, we've got a question from Anitya. He says, what's your current stand on fiber posts? Fine, I'll explain it, Anitya, but I want you to answer me this question. What is my concern here and here? and here in a long-term outcome. Why am I worried something about this? There's a recently placed crown about a year old. You understand, patients spending a lot of finances to fix their teeth. Okay, they come to me or to you to fix their teeth. So they need some sort of a assurance, which is called risk management, risk assessment. Risk assessment came from engineering. It didn't come from dentistry or from medicine. In the old mm -hmm. days, when they... Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Uh, yeah, Diana says there's no buckle bone. So what does it mean? 4-4 four, four prognosis, question mark, question mark. 3-4, three, 3-4, four, three, four. and 3-4. Three, four. Three, four. Okay. Of three, four, and three, five. So we have a tooth as had no recurrent therapy of three, five, and you have buckle bones missing. Okay, there's a dip there. You can see already the shadow here, the shadow. Okay, there's something happening there. It could be a root fracture. We don't know. It's asymptomatic at the moment. It could be also a trauma from the past extraction of the teeth distally. But my concern is that the uh, this tooth, the 3 5, could be very, very weak. 3 4 could be even weaker. So I'll be asking um, Garima to specifically look at this tooth and, uh, you know, we'll look at the sensitivity of pulp sensibility of the 3 5 as well. So really go through the whole thing, Garima, and give me the scenario where we are and we're going to give the patient explanation. They like to. She's a very lovely lady. She, she will relate to you extremely well. I believe that you, you, know, you, you will give her that comfort of knowing what's what. Because if you're going to have a problem, uh, I want to maintain this teeth because if you lose this teeth, uh, it's a, I need to maintain those teeth okay, for a long term. So I need to be able to, if you lose teeth, you're going to have a problem. Uh, now, I'll tell you what the problem would be in this case. Hmm. because I can't show any slides, but there's a huge vertical drop from the premolar to the molars. And she has a very low, low, low smile on up the lower right. So you can see the three millimeters below the gingival margin all around. That makes sense? So that if you lose those premolars, hmm. it could be a huge vertical drop and aesthetically be a nightmare for me to fix. And yes. can everyone understand how complex treatment plan can be when the prosthodontist is planning with the endodontist where I look at every avenue of what happens now, what are the possibilities? 
and what or something not going quite right okay because that will change whole trip and the patient needs to understand the risks that are associated with the with the treatment she may choose to live as it is but i doubt i don't doubt because if you explain what the problem is because patient decides not to have a treatment and that's fine because we have covered every angle every scenario to help the patient so i'm never eager to start a case until i have everything else under control and i would believe that 99 percent of the patients will accept the situation because they know that we generally care to be accurate about our diagnosis so i want you to if possible Garima, to be able to maintain those two teeth that's uh, critical okay those pre-balls to me are very critical okay mm. and i'll write that in my notes let's go to top one any questions so far i'll answer your question about about uh uh yes the implants are challenging the everything's challenging so these people are getting older they have all these restrictions that are failing it's far more complicated complicated than you think there's a quite a lot of time to be spent on the chair now what about the top these are zirconia veneers. I mean, somebody's got need to go to church here. You understand what I'm saying? Someone needs to go to church, so they have their belief system in hands. That makes sense? But you know, science and church may be, may, you know, there's, a, there's a relationship there, but maybe the, the belief tells you to believe in science a little bit and it's not to say I have a belief system. I'm going to test everything that comes, you know, to be able to use. I mean, you can flick this veneer off and you can flick that off. It's not, it's not going to bond. It's not on bond, okay? It was purely bonding like a gold or a zinc phosphate that could have better retention than the bonding zirconia. But look at what we have on top. You can see uh, one four and you can see the two six, something here on two seven. But, uh, uh, you know, it all looks good. A lot of people would be happy with this and I accept that. Uh, there's some uh, cement that's retaining on the crown. There's a repair here that's coming off, not bonded. So, uh, you know, I'm looking at this is the one five, which is a abutment to the a bridge abutment. And uh, this is a two six, and two six is a distal bridge holding a uh, you know, single uh, semi fixed attachment to the two five, two four. I'm not, I haven't got the, I didn't take the, the cross-section image of the 2.7. So here's your patient guy, what, what would be advice be here? I mean, this is failing naturally, and that would therapy yeah. is failing. I'm not sure about this. You do pulp sensitivity says, I'm not quite sure about this. Yes. See, 2.6, of, of course, uh, the previous endodontic treatment does not uh, appear to be adequate. I, don't believe the, all the canals have been instrumented um, and done well. So yes, you need to further assess these teeth, like clinically uh, check if they are tended to percussion palpation, um, check the probing depths as well, take PAs to get a better picture of how the tooth is looking. Um, yeah, peri 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 is okay. Peri is okay. Peri is okay. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Sure. So that's good. Uh, but yes, I think with these kind of patients, you just need to have a discussion as to what you see and what you suggest doing and um, what are implications of not doing endodontic treatment before she comes back to you and, you know, and vice versa. Well, you will so, assess. I'll have a chat to her. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, of course, I, I would highly suggest, um, you know, doing the endodontic revision on these teeth before she has the crowns or, you know, the bridge or anything replaced. Uh, of course, for obvious reasons. Um, yes. And uh, I would be concerned about restorability on uh, the one four. As you can see, there's quite a large restoration and there is some kind of post as well. So I don't know how much uh, structure mm -hmm. would we get once we deassemble the whole thing and um, do the end. So that's the other thing to consider as well. Would you consider apical surgery there? Yes, as long as the crown margins are... You have to replace them. Have to replace. The whole if, upper... If you have to replace 
the whole thing has to be replaced, complete, complete. Read. The whole thing has to be top and bottom has all been replaced. No question, it has to be done. They're all leaking. Oh, okay, if if you are replacing the crowns, then yeah, I would do. If you are not replacing the crowns and the crowns look, um, the the margins look okay, then of course we can consider no, 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 ethical the surgery. Are, the margins are very poor. Let me show you. Okay, so yes, uh, can't do yeah. ethical surgery. No. I no. mean, do we do we retain? Uh, is it do we retain? Do we remove consider implants? Or would you, I mean, would, I mean, epical surgery would do the job. I and mean, what's your gut feeling? This is only gut feeling. I can't, you know, it's very hard for you to make a judgment call here, of course. Yes, no, I think if, if the margins are not great, they are leaking, then um, epical surgery, I wouldn't recommend. We need to make sure that the margins are all okay. There is, uh, you know, no evidence of marginal penetration, then of course, epical surgery, but otherwise not. Otherwise that will fail in the near future too. Exactly. So, uh, okay. I'm hoping, okay. I'm hoping that, um, uh, you know, I, will, I mean, I'm happy to remove this crown, make a temporary, and then you can try to have a go to remove the post. I mean, um, it's a dilemma. One point is a dilemma, is that? Okay. With, with it is. And with the patient, the high smile line, it's a real dilemma. Can you see the concept with the upper arch and the lower arch, how the whole thing has to come together? And then, then okay, now what happens? Let's say we have to take this tooth out for an implant. She's asymptomatic. I don't know how she's going to take it. That's another question. There's a patient factor here, not just what we think, it's what the patient thinks. Okay, because, you know, she just wants it fixed. No pain, doctor, why can't you fix it? Okay, and we fix it. Well, why should and it fails? So we did, we didn't tell it will fail. So this tooth is a key tooth in the whole trip. This tooth and the molar tooth, premolar tooth, are a key trip. Okay. See how it all changes suddenly. The whole thing changes. So what are we going to take this out? Now we have a problem here. That root therapy. Okay, this one here, you know, maybe okay. I'm not sure. I'm looking at the. Uh, the pal aspect of this tooth, you know, doesn't look good. Maybe it's an artifact. Maybe it'll mm -hmm. take you home. Uh, we don't know. So that's a concern. And you have a tooth there on the left side that you can see the huge area that is uh, on, you know, on incomplete root canal therapy. So the, so the dilemma is the patient's been told by other dentists that you can just put new crowns and you'll be fine. And we are here finding all these problems. So our dilemma is, Karima, is to convey this to the patient. Yes. So it's an overall diagnosis, not just looking at the procedure now, now we're looking at a different level of treatment outcome. So uh, should be seeing you, and uh, I'm sure uh, with your expertise, you'll be able to help the patient, and uh, hopefully we can move along and maintain all the teeth. Uh, but she needs to be made understood, she come with her husband, that some teeth are very difficult. And uh, if you say, Dr. Alvin, you didn't tell me about this, that's where you come in, because you're going to have to sit down and explain to the patient that we have infection. And uh, naturally, my last question is, there are teeth that you just can't seal them, can you? No, mm, that's right. Correct. There are teeth that you just cannot do root canal therapy to see of the system, correct? Yes, absolutely, yes. Right. There can be some teeth which we, no matter how hard we try, we, we, we can't predictably restore them or, or you know, uh, seal them. Um, so yes, we, that's why the assessment comes into play. Um, we need to plan those teeth or such teeth well um, because we can't, we, we can't restore or we can't endodontically treat each and every tooth. They need, yes. I've got a question here which I, I, from Diana Berner. She says, how long would the new crowns will last considering that we have age, the oral hygiene decreases, as people can't perform well and already that margins here are quite deep. Okay, here's the question and that's a good point. Uh, 
the answer to the question, how long will that last? It depends on what we find under the ground. Okay, so we don't, I don't promise the patient that we're going to fix the problem. I promise them that it all depends on what we have under the ground. Uh, now, that's one thing. Number two is that remember one important aspect here. People want a closure in their life. They want a solution. And we need to be very understanding and empathetic how we portray our clinical and diagnostic views to the patient, to give them hope. If this lovely lady has been told that she can lose a few teeth in an incorrect way, you're going to put these people into depression. Actually, I have patients who have depression because of dental treatment. Okay, they're taking anti uh, anxiety and anti uh, antidepressant medication. And it's very, very sad. It's, it's, as, it's true as I can tell you. Um, so, what patients seeing here, this is what I'm trying to explain. This is what we teach at the college diagnosis everything, is that she's here for the last stand. In other words, I need to make it good for the next stage. Okay, it's a hard call, but that's what they're here for. Okay, now, if anyone wants to treat this patient, I'm quite happy to refer them to you. It's a complex case. Can you see the degree of complexity, functional, aesthetic? Okay, also looking at the root and where that is a whole sort of uh, treatment for the patient. And Garvey will try to do, you know, it's my sensibility testing. It's very difficult to test under the crowns. It's impossible. So, and she will explain the patient. Mimesh, can see patients are asymptomatic. What was the primary concern? Do we need to interview now or can we wait and monitor? Well, her primary concern is aesthetic she can meet. She's not happy with the color of the teeth and we need to replace them. I mean, they're not really diagnostic mock-up Mimesh on the existing crowns. We're happy, she wants that smile. Now you go back and look at the structural support. So we can't let this patient alone because somewhere along the line things will fail. Those teeth, especially on the upper arch, the leaky margins is because of leaky margins. And uh, I can add one more injury to the insult. Well, insult to the injury is the fact that same dentist has done all the root canal therapies as well as restored all those teeth. Okay, so how do we deal with the situation? Well, hopefully, uh, Garimo, in, we might invite you in the very near future to come back and uh, we might discuss this case together, if that's yeah. good yeah. with you. I look forward to it. You've been yes. tremendously helpful and uh, I can't thank you enough. While you're there, I'm going to introduce our next speaker in two weeks' time, uh, Dr. Christine Primitas Rogers, and she sends her warmest regards to you, Garima. And uh, very interesting lecture here. And I'm sure we're all looking forward to this. I am, I've met uh, Christine um, at uh, Westmead and uh, she was lecturing us. She can't remember me, but I said, you made such a great impact and I can't wait to, for you to come back and talk. Repair and regeneration in endodontics. And we'll talk about all the different concepts, materials, stem cell research. This is gonna be a, another great lecture. And uh, I believe that uh, uh, you will all benefit this. So um, uh, I want to thank you, Garima. Thank you for being with us. I want to thank Christine thank for... You. Yes, it was wonderful. It was yeah, great to be discussing these cases and uh, you all come across such cases um, almost every day. Um, exactly. And how do we plan these cases? I think that is a difficult part sometimes. Um, well, in telling... well, we, we help each other. We help each other. There's mm -hmm. one more question, Garma, that do you believe in fiber polyps? I just need to answer that question. It was given by, I'm sorry, um, there's another message coming up. They're saying thank you. Uh, we get lots of thank yous, Garma. It's wonderful. Joel, thank you for your lovely lecture. And the fiber oh. posts, the question about, oh, what is your current stand on fiber posts? Okay. You want to answer that question first and I can answer it, or you want me to answer it first, Garma? 
you can answer, but I quite, I quite um, advocate fiber post or I quite like fiber post because you can explain that better. I think coming from prosthodontist would be good. Oh no, you can, uh, I mean, I might have a totally different view. <laughs> <laughs> I'm waiting. I might, I might have a totally different view. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to hear your views now. Are you sure about that? <laughs> Gary, my, I, I, I rarely use fiber posts. I will only use fiber posts when, and I will ask you to use them or maybe to use them if I want you to seal there and there. You know, we want to seal there and there. So there's a teeth highly compromised. You've done the root canal therapy, you just seal it, and I say, can you put the post in the core, do it for me. So that in that particular case, I'm happy. Yeah. If that's okay. Because most of the time we prefer to prevent posts. I mean, the idea is to prevent posts. If you have adequate core, you don't need posts. But uh, post, um, I would place would be always goal post, has to be passive fit. I will cement with zinc phosphate. I won't cement with any of the zinc, uh, any of the um, resin cements. Uh, passivity is everything. I think, I think with a fiber post, it has to be very passive because fiber can bind as well, fiber post, and can cause crack propagation. So uh, that's why, Mike, in your case, I prefer the endodontist to put the fiber post. Uh, I like metal posts. So what I would do, I will take impressions and I will have a copper plated. So I have a whole canal that the post will go in and you just drop and you take the inverter just process drops. And I will cement zinc phosphate. And the most important thing about post and core is not the fact that post and core are not providing, uh, the post part is not providing retention. Your crown has to go another two millimeters past the post core into the root neck to create that feral effect at least two millimeters so that's the most important part so if you haven't got that you transferring the stress of the post that's what sort of post it is to the more of the um you now three to four millimeters up so gingerly that's where the fractures occur most of the time so the answer to the post it all depends how much core i have you should read a lot of good paper on by uh other metal block who wrote a lot about fiber posts it will come to me. it will come to me. I'll remember it. He wrote a lot, a lot, 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 lot. Can't remember. Uh, but uh, as well, that's the other downside of fiber pores. They are very difficult to remove. You have to actually cut through the fiber post if you need to retreat. So that's the downside of it. The other thing is they talk about the fiber post being the same uh, modules of lattice as dentine. Sorry, it's a. Uh, it doesn't work that way. Um, and. Um, doesn't work that way. Post needs to be stiff. It can't move. It needs to provide stiffness. And how you design your post and core system, which we teach you in the college naturally, is very, very important. How much to remove is very important. Okay. So, you know, if you talk about drilling a post hole, oh no, I will never do that. I'll use a number 100 K file. I will very gently remove the GP or burn the GP for one of those uh, heat sinkers like a uh, system B Buchanan or a B field type where you can remove the, the top part of the GP that you gently clean with your hand instruments and then you prepare the canal to receive the, you know, whatever you have to do. So be very careful on how you look at those cups. That's very important. Are you happy with that answer? Or Yes, yes. Or sometimes if they are very wide canals, you can use the existing root canal space to gain extra retention. You don't, if you can avoid post, of course, if you can avoid post, that's ideal. Um, but yes, as you discussed, if we, if we can do without the post, better. Always better, always. And that's be parallel and round, okay? Can be tapering because the root split. Well, okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, we had, um, I can't thank you enough, um, Garima, for your time and your expertise in presenting uh, your lecture today.
I think you were very thorough, very explanatory, and uh, students really enjoyed. I enjoyed listening to you. And uh, remember last time we spoke with uh, um, a good friend, uh, Dr. Malati, and uh, yeah. that was a regeneration. That was wonderful to receive. Uh, I'd like to also invite you in the near future to come back and present more cases. Yes. Uh, I will be grateful for that. So thank you so much from everyone and from the college, myself, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Have a good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you. All the best, Gaima. Bye bye now. Thank you. You still there, Doc? I'm How here. You been? Very good. And you? How was your day? Good. Oh. Sorry, I was a bit late. Yeah. That's okay. Look, this is what I'm doing most of the time at the moment. This is so much failed dentistry. It's, it's very sad. People, yeah. you know, it's sad. But how the hell do you find all these cases? <laughs> they, find, they find me. <laughs> <laughs> oh. They find me. But they're, they're wonderful people. You know, it's enjoyable. I want to find solutions. Yeah, for them. It's all about finding solutions for patients. That's very important. No, that it's it's good that they find the right place. We're gonna we're gonna find the name design as small tertiary. <laughs> <laughs> well we try, you know, we try. We try in the match, we try. How you been? How's your practice? Good, good, good. Uh just looking forward for a Christmas break now. <laughs> I think everyone is. Everyone is. I mean, you know, my sanity is preserved by you know, doing dancing tango, which just gives me good balance. Otherwise, I'll be totally insane. This COVID's really done enough too, too much. You know, well, it, it'll be interesting. COVID's really changed a lot of thinking, a lot of ideas. And, you know, you can't put things off, you know, in your life, just get on with it, you know. If you are, whatever you want to do, get a moment, just do it. Don't delay. Don't say, oh, if I do this, you know, if I do that, it's just, you should just get on with life and, you know, enjoy life in the moment, day to day. Don't worry about what happened yesterday. Don't worry about tomorrow. It's about today. And that's the important thing to do. And that's what exactly what I'm doing. Fantastic. No, good to see you doing your tango. Oh, yeah, I love it, man. I always want to dance. Always, I always want to dance before, you know. But I always want to dance. And, uh, you know, it's funny, a lot of, uh, when you're there, you find uh, a lot of uh, other specialists in different fields who, have this break in terms of they always want to dance and they know they're doing uh, it could be a barrister could be any other medical dental profession and that creates a good balance and i think that's very important you gotta have a balance in life it's very important get the balance right whatever you do get a balance you know i mean you know harry